I think all of you, most of you should know me already. Uh, but as we go through this discussion, um, I love disagreeing. It's what makes the world a better place. Uh, just be dis uh, just be respectful for each other. Um, and later on, if we have some good questions, I'll um, unmute people so we can actually talk. But if we get to there, uh, just remember soapboxes are for soap, meaning um, be uh, respectful of the time that you're using to ask your question or make a statement. So who am I? So I am the executive director of the Southeast Tech Hub in Esteban. I am a past co-founder of a software company called IDS Internet Dispatch Services. Um, we do use AI for dispatching, uh, dispatching shipments to drivers. Um, and yeah, I'm currently enrolled in MIT. The current module I have been on for two weeks now, three weeks, has been to do with AI. So this um, get, this has been updated since the last time I did one with that information. And I always, always think it's important that the person who is speaking discloses if you have some financial, you know, something about your finances that might uh, skew your perspective. So let's just say I do have my RSP does have shares in Microsoft. Okay, so if you don't know who the Tech Hub is, where our goal is to help incubate new technology startup companies, as well as have other technology companies that are from outside of the community come into our community. So I help facilitate that. Um, and I also work a lot with uh, the educators in, our, in the Southeast Saskatchewan to help bring in robots, building uh, computer science and things like that, drones, to help facilitate an education that is to do with technology. Oh, I see more people jumping in, that's awesome. Don't worry if you just jumped in, just a reminder, um, we have everyone muted. I am sorry, uh, but I am trying to do this by myself. So uh, just type in uh, Q&A and chat. And at the end, if we have some time, I'll unmute everyone. So what is innovation? This is a word that, word that I personally find overused and misused. So essentially, innovation is creating a new so process that has a better emergence. In English, what that means is doing something differently to make things better. And notice how I said that. I didn't use the word technology. Innovation could also just be the way you do things at off in, in an office. It could just be the way we do things culturally. Um, it could be any way, not just technology. But the goal is you're making a new process and you're going to make it better. I also like the word disruption because if you're gonna change how something is done, you're making a new process, you are going to disrupt how things have been done. And I think it's respectful and honest that as an innovator to understand that if I come up with something new, I need to be respectful to those who have been doing something a different way before. And it really helps moving things along. But to do with innovation, I know a lot of people, including myself, have, um, even Mr. Innovator, shall we say, um, feel over innovated, over disrupted. And you're not wrong. I'm going to validate that by with this, this screen here, which is um, if you look across the bottom, that is a timeline. So you can see 1785 to 1845. We had water power, water uh, making, helping make textiles and stuff. So that took about 60 years. Then we got into steam and coal. And that innovation period was 55 years and then electricity and chemicals and then petrochemicals. And you can see that the time gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Another way I like to say it is if you look at history, if you look at empires around the world through history, that they usually only have one or two innovations that makes that empire succeed. You have some other dynasties in China or say the Roman Empire that had new innovations that kept them existing for a while, but an individual person in that timeline would have only experienced one, maybe two innovations in their entire lifetime. Well, now where if you can see on this screen, we're at the point where we're, we're all being told that we have to drive electric cars, everything is AI, we have smartphones, we have the internet. I mean, when I grew up as a kid, all I had was a black and white TV with bunny ears. So if you're feeling over innovated, if you're feeling disru uh, over disrupted, you're not wrong. That's 100% true and valid. 
um, and just, just to say that out loud. Another thing I'd like to talk about with regards to innovation and inventions, and this does come directly to AI, and innovation and invention is only good, it's only bad based on what people do with it. A good example is everyone, you know, the biggest invention in the history of mankind would be the wheel, right? So the wheel has done a lot of good things, but we wouldn't have tanks without wheels. So another more modern example is Alfred Nobel, who created the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize. So he was the person who invented, let's just say he invented dynamite. It's the easiest way to say it. Um, and the news thought that he had died when he hadn't. It was one of those situations. So there was all these obituaries about Alfred Nobel, and he hadn't actually died. But he read those obituaries, and they called him the father of destruction. And he did not want to be remembered for his invention to, to be used in such a way to cause so much harm. So he took his entire fortune that he had created from the creation of nitroglycerin and dynamite and created the Nobel Peace Prize. The idea being is we can invent anything, but it's up to the humans to decide if it's gonna be good or bad. And I think that directly has a good talking point when it talks about AI. It can be good or bad. It's dependent on what we decide to do with it. So um, another one is the innovation uh, curve. Um, I always like to use the example of the A track, but I know that dates myself. But the innovation curve, you can see that right here, you got innovation happening. Somebody comes up with a cool idea. You got the cool kids in the school coming, taking on that new type of technology. And then sometimes you can think of some kind of innovation, some kind of new technology that was really popular, and then it suddenly disappears. And all this new innovation, it comes along and hits that chasm. So depending on where we are, and I'll break this down some more, but depending on what type of AI we're talking about, some of that AI is now on the other side of the chasm and uh, being used all the time, and you might not realize it. And later on, I'll give you some examples. So big picture, uh, AI. What is AI? And my prof at MIT said the other day, he said it perfectly. It's just intelligence, but it's artificial. What I mean, what he means by that, and what I mean by that is it's using our intelligence, like as a human or an animal, but it's now being done in an artificial way. It's the best way to describe it. <laughs> this is this is a very simplified version of what is AI. So essentially what is AI is you have a database. It could be a database in your contact list. It could be a database um, in your car, in your phone's GPS where you've been. It could be a database uh, of your financials in your personal QuickBooks. It could be a database of all the inventory items in your store that you might have, um, but it's a database. And all you're gonna do now is do, you're gonna ask a computer now to do something that you would normally do. So let's say, um, let's take a database of inventory items. Instead of you going in and doing research on what was sold and when, you would create an AI that would tell you what was sold and then. You can also do predictive, which is uh, tell me based on this database of what was sold and when, tell me what could happen into the future. And so that's what AI is doing. And you're, so you're just writing a bit of code that looks at that existing database and does something with it. A lot more complex, but we'll leave it at that. You're already using AI. This is one of the most known examples of AI, um, but this is a CAPTCHA. So this is when uh, you log into something and it says, um, tell me that you're a human or tell me you're not a robot which I now find funny because now you see the memes where you have AI answering these questions. But what this is doing is you're actually teaching Google's system, it's AI, what is a traffic light, what is a car? So it's actually going both ways. I don't know if everyone knew that. Neat little trick. So a little bit of history about AI. Um, a lot of people will feel that AI just suddenly happened, but it didn't. It's been brewing for 80 years. Um, so one of the 
founders, one of the fathers, grandfathers of, of AI is Alan Turing. Now, if you don't know who Alan Turing is, he's the person who the imitation game is about that they made the movie about. And there is also a urban myth so that uh, he took his life. And the way he took his life is he poisoned an apple and took a bite out of it. And the urban myth is apple symbol is uh, an homage to him. So uh, Steve Jobs, before he passed, never really answered that question. Um, so and so we don't really know, uh, but it's a nice story. But where he got his life in is he was a World War II code breaker. And so to break the Nazis' codes, he uh, pioneered um, computers, digital computers, believe it or not, not analog, but digital computers back in the day that you could program. Um, but he came up after doing his code breaking work, he came up with the idea of, can we, this is before we had the term AI, and I'll get into that in a sec, but he came up with the thought process of what if we could do, get computers to actually use intelligence instead of just doing math, because that's essentially what dumb computers are doing, they're just doing mathematical equations, what can we do? And so he created a paper in 1950 talking about computing and machine learning and intelligence. So 70, 70, 73 years ago, 74 years ago. From that, they had a number of papers. They reached out to the uh, RAND Corporation. Yes, Hollywood, that one is right. There actually is a RAND Corporation as you see in movies. It's not as evil as they say, or maybe it is, I don't know, but um, they got together and they had a, a conference uh, and that is apparently the stories is they all got drunk and nothing happened but one thing good did happen and that is they came up they coined the term of ai artificial intelligence it comes from 1956 conference so again way back and again i'm not going to get into this big timeline but i'm what i'm trying to do is convey to you how long they have been working on AI for a while. So this is just a timeline. There's some neat points here, which is this one, 1968. Arthur Clarke, also known as Arthur C. Clarke, the um, famous, famous science fiction novelist uh, who us nerds love to have read or grew up with, but also uh, Stephen uh, Kubrick, the guy from uh, who created Space Odyssey 2001. So they actually did, they actually took some of their thought process and put it out as a paper. And that is kind of who they were. They weren't just um, authors or movie directors. They were also scientists and thinkers. So way back then, um, and now we're getting into further on. So again, I'm just wanting to show to you how things have been brewing for a while. So what, how can we tell if something is truly AI, something that is truly intelligent, but artificial? So Turing came up with a thing called the Turing test. And what you're seeing on your screen right now is you have uh, a person and between them and a computer and another person is a screen, okay? And there's a little slot underneath and the person will write a conversation out and put it underneath that. And then on one side, a computer will answer it, and the other side, a human will answer it. And when the person C can't distinguish between what is a computer and what is a person, then we know that we have reached the point of artificial intelligence. So that first happened in the, I think it was 1996, and again in 2007. So we've passed that Turing test. Okay, so that's just a little bit of history. Now let's get into where we are right now with AI. So generally there are three types of AI. There is narrow AI. Now narrow AI can only do one thing and it can only do one thing well. Then you got general AI and general AI is more like you and I. We can do more than one different type of thing and we can do those things really pretty well. We have multiple skills. Where na narrow AI only has one skill. And then the, the last one is the super intelligent AI. This is the Terminator, shall we say. This is the one that, I, I'm, I'm making jokes, but this is the one that, yeah, we do need to be very cognizant of about, and we do need to ask for laws to control this one. So the interesting thing about, uh, so essentially super intelligent AI is 
an AI that can do things better than a human. Um, so the thing about these two is they're tied directly together. So general and intelli super intelligent are tied directly together because a general AI can do anything that you and I can do. So that means a general AI can make AI. So when we cross that cusp of AI making AI, then we're going to have super intelligent AI. Um, and so you've probably, if you're following the AI discourse, and if you're not, I'll just let you know, there are a lot of people, including Dr. Eric Grimson, who came out and presented to us, who are asking for laws to control this, to ensure, again, back to my original comment, which is all inventions are good or bad. It depends on the person. So they're, they're the ones who are advocating, and even Elon, uh, are advocating for some uh, laws governing what can be a general AI. Now, we're a long ways away. It might feel like we're really close, but we're actually a long ways away. There's a few people playing some fun tricks, but we're away from that. But it's something that we need to be aware of. So where are we now? So like I was saying, we're just at narrow AI. So that is image recognition, uh, natural language processing. So chat GBT, that is only natural language. I'm going to get into that some more. They're playing some tricks on you, but all they're doing is natural language. And then autonomous uh, vehicles, which as we're seeing, they're getting there, but that promise is far, far, keeps on getting pushed down further and further away, just as we start to understand the complexity. But even an autonomous vehicle can only do one thing kind of well, but eventually well, which is drive a vehicle. It can't go make a pizza. <laughs> um, now, a little bit of fun thing about AI. There is a lot of hype right now. This is called the hype cycle. And uh, innovators use this a lot uh, for all different types of technology. And essentially what this is saying is, if you wanna make a lot of money, come over here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a company and we're just gonna call it you know, Bob's AI. Whatever you wanna call it, and we'll just add AI. And then we're just gonna go out into the world and we're gonna raise a lot of money. That's what's happening right now. The follow through isn't happening as much as you think it is or as it may feel like. Um, it's just a lot of hype. And what happens here on this graph, so you can see all these dots wherever we are, there's this right in the middle called the, the trough of disillusion, disillusionment. What that's meaning is a lot of people have been overpromised a lot of things about AI. And over the next couple of years, and I'm already starting to hear it, people are going, well, this AI isn't as good as everyone said it was going to be. It's kind of like disappointing. That happens with all innovation. And so what will slowly happen as we crash from that, they will just the people who are actually still doing work on AI will continue on and eventually it will just creep up. So don't believe the hype is what I'm saying. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Where a lot of people are talking about, oh, when AI comes, you've got to be really careful because it can imitate my grandma's voice and call my brother and tell him he's in Mexico and send money, which kind of not wrong, but we've been using AI for a while yet. You just haven't really noticed it. So one good example, and I got to say, <laughs> when I learned more about AI technically uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's how to get databases, um, this one really hit home hard. When you uh, really understand what is happening on social media, uh, yeah, you, I re immediately removed Facebook from my phone and Instagram. Um, what that is, is that, so we hear, you might have heard about the Cambridge Analytica. There's a movie about it. There's a, That movie is actually pretty truthful. So what is... How Facebook makes its money is it sells all that data, right? And other people buy that data to do things. Most of it, it's good, but a lot of it, especially on the political side of the spectrum, isn't. And so you can actually create an AI saying, hey, based on all the data in Facebook, please tell me what policies I should make. And then the AI, you can then write another AI that says, please create posts for me. So. What I'd say, like, I still use Facebook, it's off my phone, but I would say with social media, if you're, 
please don't get your news. I can't believe I have to say this out loud. Please don't get your news and your political um, points from social media. You're being manipulated. It's 100% true. So just be careful on that. Uh, now, on more one of the more positive sides of things, so Google uses AI in a whole bunch of different ways. One is to ensure that we're not being gamed. So what I mean by that is people will hire social um, search engine optimizer experts, people who can game the Google search to ensure you're always at the top. So what one of the Google AIs does is, is it goes through the content of a website and says, is this real? Is this legit? Am I being gamed? Uh, and then also, what is, the, what is this website talking about? So that's one good way AI is being used there. And then on the other side, when you interact with it, when you're doing a Google search. So um, it will help AIs doing, more, like back when Google first started in the early aughts, it didn't do this, but now more and more AI is being used to help ensure that you are getting the right search for you as an individual based on where you are and other parameters. So it's a positive. Um, this one, I love this one in my car. I'm always long pressing the talk button. And so I can ask my phone, my car to do something like drive to region and that kind of thing though. I mean, it's a straight line, but you know what I mean? Um, so that is one really good, powerful tool. Anna, you, she, you know, she, if you watch her when she's, um, doing a news report and interviewing someone, she's using a voice assistant to transcribe everything or that's quite common. It's a really good thing. Voice to text again in the car. Another one, closed caption. So when YouTube was first popping up, you'd actually have to type in the closed caption or it was really poorly done. Now the language model AI will do closed caption really well. So that's really quite positive. This one I love. If you're my age and you've been you were married <laughs> before you had Google Maps, um, you know that this probably saved a lot of relationships. So instead of having one person navigating and the other person arguing, you, we now have Google Maps. It's it's such a, a godsend. Little side note: I, I do like one one of the personal stories I can relate to this is the, my software company back in 2006. Uh, before iPhone and Android existed, we were partners with BlackBerry, and BlackBerry was the first phone to have a mobile, a real GPS chipset in it. And one of the things that we did, because we got a hold of one of those phones as a partner before the uh, before it became commercially available to everyone, is we created an app that would show where a phone was, and we did that so dispatchers would know other truckers that have done. So it's kind of a fun side note. Okay, feel free to type in uh, questions or chats if you want to ask some more. I do have it in front of me, so I can see. Um, okay, another good example. This, especially in the last year, is doing quite well. I'm sure a lot of you have started getting spooked out by as you typing senses. Instead of it suggesting one word, it will actually two or three words and even a punctuation. So. That's that's AI getting more uh, language model AI is getting better and better and interacting with you on a day to day basis. So uh, one that is becoming quite well known is OpenAI. I just want to give you some background about OpenAI. So there's there's the commercial entity that's there to make money, and then above that in its hierarchy is a not for profit. Uh, entity that is their mission is to ensure that uh, AI is being used for good and that they know that the first the first disruptors are going to kind of set the stage of how AI, AI is going to get used. So the goal here was to ensure long term safety as they generate and create more AI. So. For projects like that, we, that's something that we should support. Um, and if you were watching the news last fall, there was some drama with this organization. And essentially, from what we now understand, there was a very well-known for-profit person who was trying to break this mission, um, and they got shuffled out, and the good people won. So yay for us. Round one, we won. Um, but that's them. If you haven't, um, if you want to read more about this, you can just go to their website. 
but I'm just going to talk more about OpenAI and ChatGPT. One thing I really want to ensure everyone understands is that that's a language model. What it's doing is it's taking words that you have written typed. Um, and uh, there's that one that you talked to, a little trick there. It's doing two, there's two AIs there. There's one that's taking what words you have spoken and it actually transcribes it so that the next AI can then do something with it. So it's still narrow AI, just to be aware of that. But so it can read what you've typed and then it can respond in a way that is grammatically correct and make paragraphs. That's, that is its narrow AI. And the reason why I really want to make sure that people understand that is that its res its results isn't is isn't its intelligence. So, best way to describe it, if you played with with OpenAI or ChatGPT, and you think its answers are valid, don't. That's like just doing a blind Google search and clicking on the first link and saying that is correct because that's essentially all it's doing. So for myself, the way I like to use it, because I am dyslexic, and something I've always struggled with all my life, is I will write something out now and I'll put it in there and say, hey, just check for spelling and grammar. That's the way I like to use it. Um, and then also along the same line, um, Prof brought forward to uh, us a premise uh, the other day uh, in class, and he said, what should the policy be at, at MIT with regards to people using uh, chat GBT or something similar uh, to write essays and it boiled down to simply if the essay is uh, being marked on the language, then there's a problem, but it's but in the um, information being presented, the problem with that that a student needs to understand is it's like my dad loves to come up with answers. He's a prof, so he could never say he didn't know something. And so he would make stuff up, right? So if I then said, hey, Dad, can you help me with, you know, understanding the climate in Madagascar or something, and he just made something up, I wrote an essay, handed it to the teacher, and it was wrong, that was my fault, right? So when students are using this to do research, to write something, they still just like doing Google search. They still have to validate the information just like you do. The final example I can give, real life example, I don't know if people know this one, is there was a legal aid about a year and a half ago, I think it was in New York, preparing uh, for, uh, helping prepare for a case for their lawyer. And they had to do, bring up case study to present to the judge. So they asked, asked OpenAI. And it was wrong. And no one double checked it. They just said, oh, it's AI, it's going to be great. And not understanding it's just a language model. And uh, it was presented to the judge. And it turned out they, the judge said, this is inaccurate information. And that legal aid lost her job. So just be careful. One thing a lot of people I noticed were getting all excited about was, oh, open AI can write software programs. So now we've, that must mean we went from narrow to general, meaning AI can now write code. No, it's not. Us programmers, and I'm sure Ryan will agree, um, are lazy. So there's uh, Stack Overflow and these others down here you can see on the screen where you can put code snippets. You've come up with a neat little thing, you wanna share it to the world, you put it there. Um, it's like Reddit, other programmers are saying, hey, I got this problem, can you help me? And people will, post some code solutions in code there for them. So all OpenAI is doing is going there, copying and pasting it. If you were to take, like say, write me a software program that does X, Y, Z, and it came with the code, if you threw it on into, uh, to try to make it work, I'm trying to keep this in English, but if you were to try to make it work, we'll just leave it at that, it would fail. So we're not there yet. It's just being lazy, just like we're all programmers. I can see Ryan going like this right now, even though his screen's not on. Um, if you want to play some more and you haven't had an opportunity to play with OpenAI, 
that is the website you can go to. Uh, up to 3.5, it's free. Over four, um, version four, I think it's $20 a month. Now with generative AI with images, um, if you were to look at uh, an image uh, through uh, the lens of a computer, those uh, are coordinates on a graph is the best way to describe it, um, X and Y essentially. And so what it is doing is it's transcribing those words into what it has been taught to put X's and Y's and dots on screens. They're getting really good at it now. Just don't ask it to generate a picture of someone's hand. It's quite gross. <laughs> now let's get into the fun things. So um, really good question. Is AI going to kill my job? It depends. But it's not this. I hear a lot of people talking about and it's a good discussion we have. And at this moment in time, my thought process is um, it's not going to make us all on welfare, on universal welfare, welfare. It's going to create more jobs than it's going to put under. That's what I'm seeing. I, I've seen the stats. That's also what I personally am seeing within the industry. Um, there's a lot of jobs in the coding space. And there's some other jobs I'll get to in the moment that aren't so technical. It's a shift, just like all the other disruptions we've experienced, just like, you know, the weavers who were weaving by hand, suddenly the machines were doing it back in the 1880s. So it's a shift, what I'm seeing. And these numbers from what we're, we'll never know until it's done, but the way a lot of other people are seeing is seeing it something similar. What jobs will it kill? I'm sorry, this graph is so small. <laughs> You'll probably have to lean in to look at it. But um, it's just, I was trying to show as many jobs as possible. But essentially, the jobs that it will replace are redundant and based on a database. So a legal aid who's is, is a perfect example. They Their job is to go through a database of past criminal or civil cases that and find cases that have uh, been completed with a verdict um, and that is relevant to what you're, you're about to present to a judge, that their job is to go through this big database, find it all, and put it together into something. That is an AI's job. Another job is um, some bookkeeping jobs will be replaced. And that would be more analytical bookkeeping jobs, mainly looking at analyzing the database of financial transactions and giving an answer to something. Um, even some predictive uh, cases. Uh, so, because AI does two things right now, analytical and um, predictive. So analyzing and making a, a case for the future. So those types of jobs are going to go. As far as like saying uh, welding or blue collar work, I think though, I don't, think AI is going is the pressure right now against those jobs. I think that's more automation. Um, but though, yeah, I don't see that right now. So take a good look. That's where you can see my wife being a doctor. I always bug her and say, your job's perfect for an AI, <laughs> though it's not because an AI has no root. A, a doctor or human has um, no room for error, right? Where AI has to. Have. And the reason I was making that joke is, is it's a, it, they have a knowledge, a database of ailments and symptoms, and then they have to put it together to a prescribe, to prescribe some treatment that I just described in AI, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, what jobs will it create? Now, these are the non-technical jobs. AI, AI lack one thing. And the best way to say uh, it is, is it lacks a soul. And so for um, AI, some of these new companion AIs, they're playing a game. There, there is no actual emotion there. Um, and so that for AI to succeed in, in providing us something that we need, we need to have the soul. And so the best way, and these are the jobs that it would add the humanity to that because it's too cold. And us humans are too emotional uh, in a good way. 
Um, so as you can look there, here's a list of some of the jobs. Now, content creator, that isn't a social media content creator. Um, that is more like an AI does not have the ability to create something new. So when it comes to artwork, it has to find something and do something new with it. Now, I've heard a lot of people, as some of you may know, I, I do videography and do art kind of stuff as well. Um, but the um, but there's a good argument that like some of the stuff that I've done, like when I go out and do astrophotography or Northern Lights, someone else did that. And then they showed me how to do that. And then I did it myself, right? So if I take a picture of the Northern Lights, Chuck Chow, Esteban Photo Club showed me how to do it. I then do it. So did I steal from Chuck? So that is the debate we're having right now. It's a good debate to have. And I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just open to the that thought. But you can see a lot of these jobs, you, you're not gonna need some kind of special technical e education. Oh, at, um, this, this, oops, sorry, I went back to it there. Um, ethics. That's going to be really, really important because a lot of people do things that they shouldn't be doing in other types of technology. So we now need to have people ensuring that we're following ethics. That's a good one. Now, what skills will you need uh, in an AI driven world? Just in, just you're keeping your same job, but what new skills will you need? Well, one is analytical judgment. Um, going back to that social media thing that I was talking about, I'm a bit a big advocate and becoming more and more of a stronger advocate for um, using uh, critical thinking uh, because so much information out there, uh, uh, we now need to really properly analyze it. And even with, outside of AI, just in the electronic world, we just need to be able to critically analyze things better. And so anyone who wants to be successful in their job will need to have that skill set to say, is this information being given to me accurate? Sorry, I'm just looking at uh, Ryan's uh, message here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. That's exactly right. If you guys can't see it, just on your bar, there'll be, it says Q&A in a little red bubble. Just click on that and you can see Ryan's comment. Uh, bias detection, I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, technically speaking, so right now I'm programming in Python for the last two weeks. Um, that seems to be the go-to for AI right now. And there's our programming. Um, these are all the other technical jobs. If you want to actually get into AI, I'll put it this way. If you were good in calculus, you'll be good at AI. If you weren't, just smile and go, that's cute. <laughs> Leave it at that. So the bad side. So technically speaking, there are some very interesting terms that we use now for AI. One is hallucination. Um, I love the term James Layton came up with, mansplaining. Essentially, it's my dad. I ask AI something and it just picks stuff up. And uh, that is not just with language models, that's with a lot of different AIs. And uh, even, for example, um, driving, getting Google Maps. You've heard the story, especially when Google Maps first came out, where it gave someone the wrong directions and sometimes people followed them. Um, so that there's a truth there. But there are things called AI cancers. And, um, and that's actually the technical term. One is biases. So AI it, it can only uh, function based on a database of information. Well, what is that database of information? It's information that us humans have created and put together. It could be how we interact. So our prejudices, you know, uh, our, if we have racist thoughts, if we have any as a collective whole, that all gets in there. And so the AI is only going to do is going to reflect those same biases. A, a really well-known example was a couple of years ago. Actually, I think it was only last year. Uh, the U.S. Border Guard, the U.S. Border Customs and Border people, uh, tried out a new AI to help screen people as they were coming through. 
and that same biases that uh, of, of people of different ethnicities came right through to the AI and the AI performed worse than the people. So it's something that we have to be uh, really aware of. There's a whole plethora of AI cancers, but those are the main ones. The other ones are more technical. Um, but with any of this, my doors are always open and you can come in and we can talk more about it. Uh, stuff I talked about, social media. Just be aware now, Facebook, that is AI. And I'm sure we all know people in our lives who we wonder what happened when they went on so <laughs> Facebook. Oh, there you go. Now, on the other side of bad side is um, AI has made hacking a lot easier. Though so I am more worried about quantum computing, which is a whole another subject when it comes to um, AI or it comes to hacking. But yeah, uh, if you look at some of the modern graphs, you can see like a four word, a four character password meaningless. Even now, eight with special characters um, and uh, numbers and capitals pretty much useless these days. So uh, just keep changing those passwords and, keep, and uh, keep making them bigger and bigger as much as you can. Copyright infringement. Now that's the big one that we're hearing a lot about. And a lot of the discussion I'm hearing is valid. And some of it is uh, people just don't have enough or not getting the right information. So I kind of talked about that a minute ago with regards to um, Image creating images based on other people's work. What we're starting to see is legal cases coming forward. And it seems like existing copyright law seems to be holding up. Best way to describe it in most of the developed world, it's essentially the person who clicked the shutter on the camera, the person who typed the word or wrote the word, they own the copyright. And um, and that seems to be holding up. There are some misconceptions on how, well, I don't know if it's fair to say misconceptions. There's some good discussion on how um, that database is being created to create AI. So for example, I don't know if you're aware, but um, there's a hot debate going on where uh, I think it was OpenAI was, um, I think it was, uh, or was no, it was Google had created an AI to scrape all the YouTube videos ever uploaded, right? And people were like, wait, you're breaking my copyright. I think they're breaking other things that we should talk about ethically, but for the copyright argument, it would only be if they then produced something or copied somebody's work and said it was theirs. And that what they were actually doing was trying to collect information to train, to teach its AI. So it's an interesting discussion and debate, and I hope we keep having these discussions and debates. And, um, and I hope more and more people come more informed about this stuff so that we can have an educated discussion about all of this. So, um, Corey, you can't see this question? Yep. I put it over in chat. Oh, another one, sorry, back with AI cancers, I forgot. Um, Alistair, grade 12 student, great kid. Um, there is, uh, you can trick AI. So he tricked uh, a chess AI to say that there was a third team and it was orange. <laughs> it was amazing. So yeah, we're almost there. Okay, so some good examples of where you can use AI in the uh, in your business. So one is customer relationship management tool, CRM, Salesforce, Goldmine, whatever you may use. Um, so there again, that's a database of contacts. So an AI can now do some analytics for you instead of you going in there and creating um, reports. It, you can get an AI to do that for you real time, all the time. It's really neat. But it can also now do predictions. So instead of you going in, downloading, creating, then creating uh, reports, and then 
making guesses on what will happen in the future, the AI can do that based on sales and relationships that you put into Salesforce or what have you. It's a really good, useful tool. And that's already available. Inventory management. This is, uh, I've seen it in my software world because we tie into warehousing systems. I've seen it in ERP and SAP systems. So big, big, huge uh, inventory systems. That's been around now since, I think the first time I saw it was like 2015. Um, essentially what it's doing is looking at, it's analyzing um, past stock, when stock shipped, when it did ship, um, add, adding extra factors that are external, say like weather, holidays, times of the year, uh, world events, that kind of stuff. And then it will help predict what you will need as inventory in your warehouse uh, in the future. And it's getting pretty good. Uh, the big one uh, that I saw back in 2015, 2016 was attaching inventory management AI to uh, weather. That was really helpful. Again, financial management. Again, if you're doing anything with a database that you need to analyze, so if you need to analyze your finances, um, QuickBooks has already got some AIs going on there. It's got one that's got me scratching my head, but I'm a bit too afraid to use, which is it will automatically create an invoice for a customer before they, like for the next month. And they, based on its past history, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> that worry that I got it wrong. And then I have a lot of, explaining to do, but it's a neat idea, but they have some other neat stuff. Customer support. I got a really good one at the end. So hold on. There's an awesome one at the end, which is a local company, um, but customer support. So back in the day, uh, you know, say 10 years ago, you'd have that little chat chat box that would pop up when you went to a web website, kind of annoying sometimes, kind of useful sometimes. Say when you're trying to communicate with SaskTel or Rogers because your phone's broken and they won't have a phone number. So you, you you type in there. You'll find that over the last couple of years, especially over the last year, it's actually working quite well and it is very useful. That is because it's using a language model. Corey, can you see the question now? Over in the chat. Just answer when you can. Um, okay, AI in image. So we've talked about, you guys have seen the image AI maybe where you've typed in, you know, draw me a picture of a flower in a window and there it goes. It's pretty neat. You'll notice that there's still, if you look carefully, there's still some artifacts there. It's getting better with people for sure, but definitely get it to draw hands. It's pretty scary. Um, but one of the ones that I use with my video editing is I can now uh, take an interview and it will transcribe. Uh, the entire person's interview. In the past, I would actually have to watch the screen and cut where I want to cut to make the interview shorter. Now I can just look at the words and just say, cut out all these words, put these words together, click, and then it will get all the proper images and put together. <clears throat> I can also have it create frames that are missing. I can have it if someone is talking and they stop themselves from talking and then they finish the sentence. You can add a couple of extra sentences on using their voice. Useful, kind of wow, pretty cool stuff. Um, you can also, these are other ones where I, the, they, they're now doing uh, video, um, actually generating video. That stuff's pretty neat. I personally, I don't know if you guys have played with it a lot, but I personally, I feel like I can tell, but maybe because I'm a videographer, I'm a bit of a snob. I don't know. Um, oh, we just talked about that one. So here's one that is really, really neat. Uh, um, this is a company, uh, they were originally, I think out of Yorkton, and now they're in Regina, and they're doing this stuff around the Southeast and the West. And what they're doing is they'll take grain and they will sample it with a camera, and then they'll grade the grain. And the reason why they went this way was that um, it takes eight years to train someone to be able to grade grain properly um, and consistently. And they're finding in the, that industry, well, because of the pay, there's not enough people doing it. And uh, it sounds like, I mean, they could always pay people more, but they're choosing not to. Um, and they're also finding that um, the chain of custody of the grade is becoming more and more important. So what that means is, 
that starting off with the farmer and the marketer, there is a good discussion on what the grade should be. This would help solve that. But then they ship it to the elevator and they have to prove that the grain grade is the same. They put it on a train, gets to say Vancouver to the big grain elevators there. They have to prove it's the same grain again, uh, grade again, just to make sure no one's played with it. And that goes all the way down the line. Yeah, even on the in China, the, the Canadian grade is received, same thing. And so it's becoming quite a, a challenge. And this is where AI is doing well, right? So it, AI image recognition is doing a decent job at it. So these guys are putting this together. One of the little spin-offs that they're doing is on this first column here on the combine. So they realized that they could have this image grader on the combine. So as the combine is harvesting, uh, it will be able to say this grain right now has this much extra moisture, extra mold or mold or more protein and what have you. And as you guys know, combines now keep uh, do a lot with GPS. So it can now overlay, say, the case or the John Deere map, overlay it with a layout of what the quality of the grain is at that point so that the farmer at the end of the year can look and say, okay, I know overall I had mold in my, my grain, but I don't know where it came from. They can now see it came from this part of the field or the extra protein came from this part of the field. So, um, so it's pretty... It's pretty cool that that they can do that. And then the other one is um, this middle one is where they are. Uh, this is where the marketer and the and the farmer are having a discussion on the quality of the grain, right? So it'll be interesting to see how this comes out because I'm I know that yeah we could just imagine the marketer and the grain uh, farmer having a discussion and pulling out one of these units. But this unit is essentially the same size as a large. Uh, uh, coffee maker, coffee grinder is what it looks like. And it just, at the top is a hopper. You put the grain in it and just slides down, falls down. And as it's falling down, it's taking images of the grain and just taking a good look at it. And then the last one is in line, which is the chain of custody as it's moving around. Um, I'm from BC. I don't know much about farming, but this is some more information about what they're doing. So it's just kind of like, they what type of uh, grain they can do and um, and what have you. How are we doing for time? Oh, good, five minutes. Um, one of the problems that we do have with um, AI is being able to audit. So what I mean by that is you and I, we're doing say some financials or some budget on an Excel sheet. We look at the bottom number and we're like, that doesn't make sense. So we can go back through our Excel sheet and say, oh, that's where I made my mistake. AI, it's not so easy. Uh, one is because the person who's created the AI, that a, that process has been patented, and they don't want to sh share to the world their secret sauce. The other part is just the way AI works. It's just it's hard to go back and do why why did you make that logical decision? So one of the things that they've done to help that is the ground truth guys have give you an image and you can see around some of the kernels there's a square and a different color and then you can see over on the left the, the, it's broken you know you, that kind of stuff so you, or it's a stem so you can see why it chose to take to choose grade uh that grade as far as biases is concerned right now or the first few years of i think they've now hired some some more people but when i was up there last talking to them, they only had one person doing the grading. He was, he was a professional grader, had been doing it for years. But um, again, you, you, you can introduce a bias that we all have. So they're going to have to, and they are looking at doing it, if they haven't already, is have other people who are professional graders come in and grade the same grain. So, yeah, there's a YouTube video. It's uh, Ground Truth. I'll go back. That's the company, groundtruth.ag. Uh, they're in Regina. And um, that is their YouTube channel. The reason why I'm bringing this up is as I go around in Southeast Saskatchewan, I hear stories about labor shortages. And I don't see it getting any better, right? If we, From what I understand, with the baby boomers retiring, 
it's affecting the whole labor force. And so we're really missing a skill set. So some of these things can be used to help fill in those holes so that we can succeed. The thing that keeps me awake all night is that I know this stuff is happening and I worry that it's not happening here. It's happening elsewhere. And if it's helping, like I know um, there's some stuff happening in the EU with John Deere. And I worry that because it's happening there, that technology is going to be forced on us. We'll have no choice because we have to do it to survive economically. I love this ground truth because this is a local company trying to create those jobs and that industry here. So if you're in oil and gas or agriculture or any of our things that are suffering for um, for labor shortage, this is an idea you can look at. And don't worry if you don't know technically not how to do it. You know, we have Ryan here, we have myself, we have others in our community that can help you with the technology side of things. All you need is an idea. And because you see a pain and you're like, hey, I think maybe this could happen. Um, then come in and talk to me and we'll see if we can help uh, work that out for you. Anyways, we're running out of time and that is the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any other questions or thoughts or comments? Just type it in. If not, you can always come by the Tech Hub. We're in the parking lot behind the Affinity Credit Union and uh, Negan and I are here. Um, so you can just come in and chat. Maybe I'll do this. Oh, it's, there's Alistair. I'm just unmuting everyone. So you can just unmute one at a time and just if you have any questions or thoughts. No, everyone's so quiet. Super <laughs> cool, Gord. This is awesome. I would have too many questions, so. Oh, is chat disabled? Sorry about that. Okay, well, let's see, leave it there. Um, again, you know where I am. Come on by, chat. And if you have any questions, thoughts, or any business ideas. Hey, Cord. Oh, there's Corey. Yeah. Um, question for you, I guess. the It's, it's relevant to um specifically relevant to specifically um what we've talked about in the past i have um excel documents that can be populated into or that that, that help create my that help create my my presentations and that's obviously a huge time suck right yeah. and i feel like those things could be built into or should be built into what we've already talked about, right? A CRM yeah. um, database that, uh, and then also having something that maybe scrubs PDF documents from the insurance company and and puts all the information together, right? So yeah. to your point, when you were talking about, that's, that's where I see an advantage with AI for my business, for sure. Um, I guess and maybe. that's a good example because you don't have the t money and the time to do that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, what would you use for that? That's not an open AI thing, right? Well, Copilot. So, a lot of my PowerPoints, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of my PowerPoints now lately, I just get Copilot to, I just write the slides and say go, and then it just designs it for me. I get some choices on that, so that that's quite useful. Um, but there's guys, no hallucination in that, right? Like it goes. No, 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 no. I know that's a really good point. No, mm -hmm. it, because it it all it's doing is I put in the content, and then all it's doing is creating the design. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I came across yeah. an article on uh, um, OpenAI where yep. it was compared to blurry JPEG in sense of like you know if you go into search engine, you get the picture and it's not blurry, but there's too many of them. When you go into OpenAI, it goes into compressed data 
and pulls out stuff and kind of oh. blurry image of what it was. It gives you some information, but you never can really trust it because it collects from a lot of sources. And like you pointed out, it doesn't name the sources. So you can't really go back and check where it came from. So like with that system, you wouldn't be able to just, you know, load the data and say, hey, get it done. You'll have to go back and, and check, pack yeah. check pretty much. Yeah. And just I think the key point there is with chat GPT, what is its intelligence that is being artificial language? Mm -hmm. That's it. So a lot, then a lot of people are misunderstanding it, thinking it, it is an all-knowing uh, computer that knows everything about the universe, and it's not. And and even with image, that's a good example because it's based, like you were said, it it's basing its generative AI on compressed images. So it's seeing the compression, thinking that's normal, and make that that's a good example. Um, yeah, no. There was another, no. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, I can just weigh in really quickly here a little yeah. bit on, on some of it. Um, with uh, processing data and things and, and writing programs with AI, well, and just using generative AI in general, what where it's really beneficial is when you're trying to um, get started, get organized, create a template, you know, give it the the simple tasks that are time consuming for us. You know, it can take hours to, you know, just create a template and then, uh, you know, so generative AI can help you do those tasks so that you can focus on the actual intelligence tasks that um, it's not good at, where you know, it might hallucinate and get information incorrect, but if you can get it to do the, the easy repetitive tasks and get you started, then that frees up your time to focus on, you know, the truly, uh, you know, challenging problems. And I think that's where, like, you know, the really beneficial part about generative AI comes from, where we can essentially make ourselves more efficient by you know, offloading the really simple tasks. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, Ryan. Totally nailed it. Like some prime examples is like I'm writing an, a business plan for something else I'm doing, and I just and and I said, create me a template for this type of industry at this location uh, for a business plan, and I think I said make it professional, whatever. And it just, I liked how it it it, it that's something I used to do before I would start a process and it would do that all for me. The other thing, again, I just like for time saving, being dyslexic, it takes me, you know, I write an email, it takes me a good half an hour to proof it sometimes. Now you could just dump it in there, get it changed, saves me time. Sorry, Alistair, go for it. What? Oh, I, I, I saw your name pop up. Were you trying to speak or was that background noise? Um. I think that was background noise. Okay. Are you, are you still playing three person chess? Uh no, not really. <laughs> Fortunately, the past few days I haven't played much chess at all because I've been uh a little bit stuck. Yeah. Anybody else with any thoughts or questions? <laughs> 